so this week we are formally uh former yeah formally actually bringing beginning the book uh at chapter one we're going to be talking about saving source and blank slates um the learning objectives i pulled out are to list some benefits of working in an ide uh to configure our environment to start from a blank slate um, to use hotkeys for restarting R and running code, um, to understand and explain why this RM list equals LS is bad practice, um, to break analyses into phases to save objects at, or um, oh, that's got a typo in it, to break analyses into phases um, by saving objects at logical steps. And uh, I added this thing in about recognizing targets Target, yeah, the package targets has an option for automating workflows. It's not actually mentioned in the book because the book predates targets, but um, I wanted to talk about that a little bit. So we'll talk about that at the end. All right. Oh. So, uh, I mean, I think, I don't know. I don't know if um, if you work in our studio regularly, but if you work in our, our studio, that is an IDE. Uh, IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. The idea of an IDE is that somewhere where um, for something like R, you can write the code and run the code. Um, and ideally, um, or a lot of times IDEs also have like built-in help documentation and um, you know GitHub integration and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but the important part is that you can run your R code without having to leave your script. So you're not like going back and forth. And like the reason that they really recommend working in an IDE is it, that way you are encouraged both to work in a script and to see what you're doing as you go. Not, you know, you don't just work in the shell and lose what you're working on. You also don't write for hours without ever seeing how the code actually executes. Um, and then the discussion I put in here is uh, we had uh, Shem Sedin last week and he's not here this week, but I know he works in VS code. I don't know. Uh, Mohammed, if you work in our studio or anything, you know, if you also work in anything else, um, I work in our studio exclusively, personally. So I don't know. I, I think Federica, you also work in our studio exclusively. Is that right? And yes, 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 mostly. Yeah. yeah. How about you, Mohammed? I, yeah, I've been exclusively working in our studio. And only recently I started to experiment with VS Code, especially okay. after the release of Code Spaces on GitHub. Okay. And then I have watched this, uh, there was a YouTube video on uh, Lander's YouTube channel yep. about using VS Code for running R. Uh, yeah. And okay. Yeah, so, it, but only only for a short while. <laughs> but I always miss I, R with you. Yeah, I, I started to set up VS Code um when copilot was in beta uh mm -hmm. and and freely available to play with it and it like i don't know i hit a snag and i was like okay it's not worth it like i didn't like i never finished setting it up especially um, if you're uh, if you're like me and like to write everything in r markdown right uh, yeah the r markdown for for only for Mac is supported. Like it's, it, it says that the extension for R Markdown in VS Code says that it only guaranteed to work on Mac, yeah. but nothing else. So this was an upset for me. For sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I. I mean, I know all the hotkeys in our studio. Uh, I. I'm used to it, so it's hard to switch uh, without a really good reason. If I were working in Python. I think I would probably try to work in VS Code, even though our studio also works pretty well for Python. Um, just there's more ex like Python specific stuff mm -hmm. uh, for VS Code. But yeah, uh, in any case, whether it's VS Code, our studio, or something else, you know, they're they're strong advice is always work in an IDE or not. I mean, sometimes you want to run something from a command line in certain situations or um, like if uh, I, I'm sure we'll get to this at some point, but I have my R Studio set up to auto run, um, use this and Dev Tools like auto library them, um, which can sometimes make updating packages a little painful, and so sometimes by, I end up by auto run. You mean load it? Just load yeah. it? Yeah, 
the okay. library uh, when my, and actually it's in all of my, it's in my R profile. So it also happens yeah. if I just run R from uh, the shell. Okay. But there are times when running just R, you know, the built-in R um, environment makes updating some things easier. So very rarely I'll run R directly, uh, but not, not much. <laughs> Mostly I do everything through our studio. Um, yeah. All right. Any any other thoughts on that? I think we're all kind of on board with this one. Of yep. <laughs> what, what about GitHub? Do you also use Git, uh, the Git extensions in in our studio? I because do. I've, I've I've experienced experienced some uh, hiccups with it. Yeah. Really? Well, yeah. I, I uh, go ahead. No, no, but, but uh, yeah, that, that was all. Like I had some hiccups, and I was like, ah, oh, yeah. And, and then I started maybe pushing things on the command line. So I use the terminal. Sometimes I switch to the terminal and try to push things from the terminal. I almost never use the command line because, and um, I don't know if we'll get to it in this, but uh, I pretty religiously use the use this GitHub uh, functions. Uh -huh. And I'll tell you, I can tell when people don't with uh, our book club uh, repos, be or not always, but there are times where something gets broken and it's broken in a way that the use this uh, functions would have just taken care of. And so I am a big advocate of using the GitHub or the use this PR underscore functions. They um, help you avoid headaches. Uh, and the other side of that is for last week, I, you know, I ran through um, how to set up GitHub in this club and um, I like uninstalled everything off of my system just to do it from scratch because I hadn't done it in a long time. There were there were one or two things that were a little, um, I don't know, weird. Uh, but I like the help that we have uh, in our rep repository should cover all the cases now. So if you go, oh, is that going to load? Come on. Oh, there we go. Um, all of our book club repositories have this link at the top, set up Git and GitHub to work with our studio. And if you walk through these and it doesn't work, please let me know. Cause I've gone through this a couple of times with, with different people and now with myself. And I think we have all the, or at least most of the cases. There's still the case of if you're on a really old system, it, I can't help you, but um, other than that, I think it, it should work. So I'm a big advocate of those. Um, all right. Uh, the next thing that uh, she recommends, and I always, I think this is interesting because um, Jenny and like Hadley uh, recommend that set it, setting this setting, turn off, restore our data into workspace at startup and save workspace to our data on exit, never. They say, do that. That is not the default in our studio. And I think it's interesting that they lost that battle or something. Like, I don't know why it's not the default if yeah. they recommend it. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, it's, it's quite ironic that someone like Headley in, in the right. team of our studio recommends something which is not the default. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it could be historic, something historic. I think maybe that's like the R default. And so they don't want to overrule the R default um, by default, something like that. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, this, you know, the reason for this is that when you start our studio, um, I mean, you can put things in your our profile that will, you know, like I said, I, I automatically re library use this in dev tools, but I know I did that. So I know that that's happening and I know how to disable that if I want to want to make sure everything's working um, without it. But if you restore uh, your data at your workspace or into your workspace when you start up, you might not realize that you have something weird. You might have, you. Um, one thing about ours, you can redefine almost everything. So like you can redefine what the assignment arrow does. And if you have that in your environment and you forget that it's there, nothing's going to work how you think it's going to work. Um, and so, I mean, that's an extreme case, but the idea being you want, you want it to be a clean slate uh, when you start. So that's what this is about. Um, 
I do want to, uh, Sham, uh, Sham Sadeen joined, and I wanted to go back for this slide, uh, if you are able to speak that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you work in VS Code, right? Yes, sure. Um, so I, I'm just curious, like, uh, why? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, so uh, basically, um, so I started using R. Um, so R is okay, but move using Python. And it turns out that, um, you know, um, I want to, you know, migrate also to VS Code because I can use Python and I can use R so I can combine everything and I can learn more about the VS Code if I'm using R there. I can learn every day so that I can become better at using the VS Code. So that's, that's the fair. main reason. Yeah, <laughs> that's the main reason because I use, you know, uh, Python now for machine learning and deep learning a lot. So that's the main reason. Yep. And okay. uh, one thing also um, that, uh, you know, um, I find it, you know, now that helpful for me in, <laughs> in BS code, I use, um, you know, GitHub Copilot. I just yeah. write code, okay. R code <laughs> automatically you know, write code for me and just edit some stuff like that. Um, right. you know, I code faster in BS code than in R. I need to type everything from the, you know, but in BS code, you can just type, you know, um, English, I, I can write the code automatically for you and just edit and move faster. Fair yeah. enough. <laughs> yeah, that is exactly the reason that I started to look into VS Code is GitHub Copilot. So I thought that could be related to what you're doing. And I, yeah, I didn't know that you worked in Python a lot. And so, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So, yeah. Um, any thoughts on the, the R data before I move on from that one? I mean, I think that one kind of is what it is. Yeah. Um, can you come back? Um, why do we yeah. need to uncheck this restore stuff? Oh. Um, yeah. yeah. So the the idea here is um, these settings. Uh, again, it's this is the default in our studio that when you close your window, it saves any data that you have in memory. So any objects that you've created, it saves them uh, on exit. That's what the uh, save workspace to our data on exit means. And then when you reload our studio, whatever objects those were get reloaded into uh, memory. And the reason they recommend not doing that is it, um, like it encourages you not to make things reproducible, um, or it, it, and it, it can like, it changes the state of the starting point. It, it's the, you should always like start from a blank slate so that anything you're running in your script actually does reproduce what okay. you think it's going to reproduce. So otherwise, if you've got all this stuff in Ram, and then you hand your script to someone else, you know, you think it's working, everything's okay. great. You hand it some, to someone else and they don't have those things in RAM. So it doesn't work. Okay, um, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, it is like, if you're working with, you know, like I think you work with some large language models and things that uh, it can feel scary. Like, oh God, I gotta like restore that into RAM. But she talks about, I think that's the, nope, that's in the upcoming one, but she talks about, uh, well, okay, if there's something that you really like, it takes a long time to generate it and get it into RAM, save that on purpose and then load that in the next step. Don't uh, don't just count on the environment to automatically save it for you. So that seems, you know, that's fair enough. Um, all right, so the next thing is she does talk about some hotkeys and I did not know about this one. And I don't know how I never knew about that. that. So there's controller command, shift F10 will restart R. She highly recommends do that a lot. Um, kind of for the same, you know, once you have that setting off, uh, restarting R will clear everything out of your uh, memory and lets you see, like, does your script do what you think it's gonna do? And it gets rid of any weird state that you're in. Uh, so that's the idea of restarting often. And then there's this controller command, uh, alt or option B, which runs code from the top of your script down to wherever your cursor is. I I knew control enter, which I had added here to run just the line that you're on or the stuff that you have selected and control shift enter runs the whole file, but control alt B only comes down to wherever your cursor is. So you can use that. Uh, and that's sorry, that's in if you're in a dot R, um, you can use that to like get back to wherever you were. So it, it's kind of like manually doing the restore 
data thing, but making sure that your script is able to restore it. Uh, likewise, control uh, alt p uh, control alt shift p in uh, RMD runs every chunk above the chunk that you're at. There's a button to do that too. So I, that one I knew about just because it's there's a UI element that'll do it. I didn't know about the control alt b, and I'll probably be using that a fair amount. I mean, I mostly work within packages, so it's different there, but um, and anyway, then run this line and run this file are the other two that I have here. Any any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, mine is not a thought, but just mm -hmm. a question. Like, I don't know why I default using always RMD. I don't use the, you know, mm -hmm. um, because I'm doing analysis. I'm always default to just creating RMD and do my analysis out there. Um, is it compelling? What is compelling reason why I should use just R script, you know? Um, oh, if you are in the habit already of using RMD, you're, uh, you're doing the right thing in my opinion, and I'll bet we'll get there uh, throughout this. Um, the only reason that I will work in, our, like I I, I kind of end up working in our scripts more than RMD, it's a mix, but I write a lot of packages. And so in that case, I'm in an R script, but I also try to make sure that I write vignettes to go with whatever I'm doing in the package. And so then I'm also in an RMD. I, um, it's in my opinion, it is better to work in RMD than R, almost all the time. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, uh, if you want, code, you know, just like code to execute without uh, the comments around it. Like if you're setting something up for an API um, or for uh, a script, you know, for to something to run on a schedule or something. That's where you want to work in a dot R because the um, the pros doesn't have anything to do with it. Uh, but yeah, working in RMD, that's one of the great things about ours. The standard is to kind of explain yourself as you go. And that's a that's good practice. And I'm sure we're going to have at least one chapter about that at some point um, in this book. So, well, maybe not, but I wouldn't be surprised. All right. Up next... <laughs> so she uh, she talks about this RM list equals LS that you'll see in a lot of scripts. I'll bet uh, Copilot and um, Chat GPT GPT probably throw this into scripts from, from time to time because a lot of people do it. And the way she explains it is, yeah, you feel like you're doing the right thing, but I you know I created this example just to show that you can create something that just starts with a dot. And when you RM list equals LS, it doesn't delete it unless you explicitly tell it, oh wait, no, also do things with dots in it. Um, it doesn't reset any packages that you've loaded. Um, it doesn't really reset the state like you think it is. And so that's why she says, don't do that. Plus it's just kind of rude that if um, someone's running your script and they don't realize that it's there and then, oh crap, this thing that I had generated and hadn't saved yet is gone. Um, so that's, that's what this was all about is it's better to actually restart R. Don't just remove the things that are in me memory. And she has a blog post about it that got famous enough that there's a hex sticker that is about Jenny Bryant, uh, setting your laptop on fire. So, um, I've heard about this one, uh, <laughs> when I was uh, learning about here, here package. Yep. Yeah, and this is where I came about uh, to learn this uh, good <laughs> practice of never using RM uh, list LS. Yes. So the other thing that's in that blog post is about um, set WD and how bad that is in scripts. And that's in, I think, like the next chapter is kind of about that concept of being aware of your projects and your working directory. Uh, but yeah, those two things are the things that Jenny's most famous for I mean, I mean, I don't know. She does lots of great things, but those are the fun, the ones that people jokingly refer to because uh, she said that if you do that, she will uh, set your computer on fire. Oh. Um, yeah, how are we in the new R for DS? Um, you know, we have there is something that talks uh, um, about this. Um, you know, using here, here, or you know, uh, because um, previous. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, previously, I know, um, you know, there is no this 
RM also in r 4 ds so I don't use it at all. I just restart my, you know, but what I'm saying like that, um, it will be useful like to have a good practice on that, like using here, here in also r 4 ds What do you think, John? Yeah. Um, uh, it is good practice. So it, it, it's probably not a bad idea for us to kind of build it into the book clubs and have every book club automatically install here and uh, work from there. I think uh, I think in the next chapter, we're going to talk about the package here. So at least in an upcoming chapter, it's likely to uh, appear. Um, so we'll talk about it more then. But yeah, it is a good way to make sure that um, you know, relative paths work how you think they're going to work and all that kind of thing. So is what that, uh, that's what uh, that package is for. Can you, can you put the link uh, in the chat? Um, it's, yeah, it's just yeah. here. Let's do. Um, so it's, yeah, it's just a package and actually Jenny is, uh, one of the contributors for, uh, keeping track of, uh, relative paths to things. And it works with, if you're in a package, the root is always the root of the package, even if you've set your working directory down into the package. And so it, things like that, that it, um, it keeps things consistent. Um, but yeah, like I said, I think probably we'll talk about that package uh, in more detail. It, it, even if the book doesn't, the workshop does. So we'll talk about that um, in probably next week. I haven't read the chapter yet, but that would be my guess. Do you have the link for the for her um, post? The oh, yeah, it's so uh, the notes are up at uh, that. And then the, so that post is there, but it's, the post is also linked in the notes. Um, and it's also actually linked in the original book. It's at the, it's in the resources at the end of that, of chapter one. Um, all right. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so uh, yeah. I was looking go, go at the, the chapter, but uh, I'm not in the notes, so. Yeah. And, and it's buried down in the resources at the end of the chapter. So if we go to, you know, links to other resources, it's here is that link. And it's easy to kind of miss. It looks like it's, oh, here's some other stuff that you might want to go read about. But this one is pretty um, interesting and all the discussion around it. So uh, it's worth looking into. That, that's interesting, the, okay. the uh, list of interesting because um, I, I uh, usually, I used the, to use that that formula, and uh, I used to put it on top of, the, of my script, so yep. I have to, to run. A lot of things teach it, like um, especially older resources uh, will teach that as something that you should put at the start of every script, and um, like it's a way to kind of identify if someone like writes a blog post right now and tells you to start with that in their script, then oh, don't, probably don't read the rest of it because they're working on policies of how you would do things 15 years ago and it's not going to be the best way to do things. Probably. Um, but yeah, it used, I think it used to be a lot more common or I mean, it's still pretty common, but it used to be more advised than it is now. Um, all right. So the next thing is uh, that she says is, you know, save often slash like break your workflow up into separate files. Um, so if you have a uh, some giant long running thing to generate something that goes into RAM, and that's the thing that you're afraid of losing when you restart your R session, well, then probably you should put a save point in, save that thing to as an RDS, and then that kind of defines the end of that section of your workflow, whether it's a separate script or just a separate step that um, generating that thing, that's one piece of the workflow, and then probably put that into its own file and you can load that in when you need to uh, uh, generate the thing and um, all of that. So um, I just, 
I liked that she explicitly pointed that out because that's the only thing about, um, you know, the was a control shift F10. The thing that will often stop me from doing that is like, ah, but it took so long to make this thing. It's like, yeah, okay, then save it. <laughs> like if it's, if it's something, and you know, sometimes those things will take forever and then it's even a small file. So definitely save it. But even if it's large, whatever, if you save it off as an RDS, so you can load it back in. That's in our, um, I don't think I wrote this down. I don't even think, I don't remember if she specifically mentions. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, save RDS and read RDS are the, they're not the first things that people necessarily learn about saving and loading data in R. It's, there's just, um, I don't even know, what is it? Read and write, saving, the, whatever the other ones are. I don't use them anymore because that takes everything that you have in your memory and saves it as a single object if you do the the um, the other way of doing it. Save RDS takes a specific object and um, saves it to a specific place. And so actually, yeah, I see in the book here, she does mention here, I don't think... Um, I don't think she had introduced what the heck the here package is. Uh, oh, actually, okay. Um, oh, no, download here, not the package here. Um, I don't think, yeah, I don't think she specifically talked about it yet, but she does use it. So if we see here, she's using the package here. This is saying, I want to save it into the results directory, and I'm saving it as my precious.rds. Um, save RDS, it just, it saves a, an individual thing and our object, um, our data storage, I think is what RDS stands for, um, with a file name. So you can save save a thing and almost anything that you work with in R, you can save as an RDS. The almost is because if you're doing things like um, some like a, a torch uh, model, a torch deep learning model, you have to use the torch save process because it's actually referencing to an object that's um, not really an R object at that point. There are weird cases where say, uh, save RDS won't work, but for the most part, if you have some big thing, save RDS and then read RDS, we'll read it back in. Um, and if, uh, like, if you use some specific package to generate that thing, that package almost always will have a function for saving the thing sometimes and again we'll probably get to this at some point but sometimes it's called serialize that's the like technical term for saving a thing for like making a thing savable is serializing it uh and so you'll see that reference sometimes but save often um and split things off if they're a save point if they're a point of generating some big thing so just yeah, good advice there. go ahead i would like to comment on your uh you said that save our rds uh, is you prefer it over using read and write the other one and yeah. i would second this because the others they load the object into your environment without assigning it into a, a certain object yeah right. and what what happens is that if you have if you are working on an object and then you have already saved the previous version of this object and you would like to load it if you, if you load it in yeah. the different way it would it wouldn't override it, but it would make a new environment with uh, an object with the same name. So what would okay. happen is, is that you would have two objects with the same name, <laughs> but you automatically have a new environment. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. So yeah, save RDS, just uh, save RDS, read RDS, make everything cleaner. There are also technically other formats other than RDS. Um, and even within RDS, there are some options on how to compress the RDS object that can change things. Um, but for the, you know, step one is get in the habit of using save RDS and read RDS. Uh, that way you're saving specific objects that you want to save and you're like paying attention to how it saves is the idea. Now, Saving your whole environment, sometimes maybe that can make sense, but it's safer to uh, target what you're saving. Um, all right. Um, so yeah, the book talks about, like she briefly mentions Drake. Hi, John. Yeah? Um, so what about, because I'm try I wanted to try this, but I didn't have a chance, like this package, what's it that track, you know, your, experiment that 
if you want to rerun, it takes care of, you know, long code. Um, what is the name of this plugin? Targets? Target, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yes. Uh, I don't use targets yet. And it's not in this book because this book is older than the package targets. Uh, but mm -hmm. like every everything I hear is yes, use targets. Like it's really yeah. good <laughs> at keep, keeping track of what has changed. And then so it mm -hmm. only reruns the code to generate the things that have changed that you care about. So like if you have some large project and you know you re you edit this piece of code up here and it impacts this then it'll rerun that piece of code but if it doesn't have to run in the stuff in between it doesn't bother um and it it also deals with like you can automatically save pieces of it off to um amazon s3 or different things like that um i have not actually used targets so i don't plan to lead a discussion about targets but if anyone has used it um I'd love to hear it. And if you haven't, I think probably we'll add a week somewhere, um, one of the chapters that doesn't actually exist or something just to go over targets. I can't do it because I haven't used it. So I can't like explain it today. Um, yeah. I can also yeah. volunteer because I okay. to use it. Um, but if we can add one week, I can volunteer to do that as well on the target. Yeah. Um, we'll look into it like after. Um, after next week. So sometime in the new year, okay. we'll, we'll dig into it. But yeah, that's, she mentions this, the R package Drake and Drake oh. is created by the same guy who created targets. Yeah. It's like mm -hmm. the, it's targets for version zero. Um, and yeah. Uh, and wait, yeah. In the book that she links to, he says, no, yeah. Use targets. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Drake was his first attempt at creating um, uh, this type of package, and then he moved on to uh, targets. Um, so, yes, I highly recommend it, even though I haven't used it because everyone says how amazing it is, and I just never had. Um, it, it didn't fit into any workflow I was working on, but now uh, it will. <laughs> um, and yeah, there are a whole bunch of add-on packages that have been made for targets. So that's what this Targetopia uh, thing is about. Oh, okay. Um, that there are packages to work with different types of data mm -hmm. um, and saving it in different ways and different types of workflows. So um, yeah, we'll talk about that. Um, I think that's, oh, yeah. What do you mean, John, by sub-packet? Can you go back to the... This... Um, yeah, yeah, previous, yeah. So, what is this? Uh, uh, there's the oh, tag? the back to here. So, he just has this badge that says it's a member of the R target topia, and actually, it, then it doesn't have a link to what that means anywhere handy. But if we go to um, CRAN and probably other places to do it too, but um, uh, target types, T archetypes is the one that I knew about, but there's also Git targets, JAX targets. Um, T archetypes is, is um, um, different like uh, archetypes, so different styles of targets. And so it has um, functions to set up a project in a certain style. Um, again, I haven't actually used it. I just know it exists. So okay. um, at some point we'll look into the details about what this means, but it'll okay, tell you, you like this, uh, T archetypes or target types um, is kind of the add-on to targets that makes it uh, easy to create complicated pipelines. All right. So yeah, I don't have anything more there, I guess. So the last piece is to review, looking at the um, uh, learning objectives that I spelled out. Um, so some benefits working in an IDE, it, the idea is that it makes it easy to both right in a script and execute your code so you can see what's going on and you can get you know deeper you can get integrations and all kinds of stuff like we talk about talked about um the next one is about just that checkbox and the drop down menu of turn off the dot data or dot r data um 
and you do that so that you start from a blank slate so that you're always starting from um, the same point. Uh, and then we learned some hot key or we went over some hot keys and I recommend um, like going to that slide and making sure that you're used to all of them. Uh, the um, was it like, I don't even remember the restart because I don't use this restart R control shift F10. I need to learn that. I do that by going up to the menu and selecting restart R. And I think if I used uh, control shift F10, I would probably do it more often, which is a good thing to do. So I want to start um, getting in the habit of using that hotkey. Um, and yeah, we saw that RM list equals LS really the problem. Like it feels like the problem is that you're going to break someone's environment, but really the problem is it just doesn't do em enough. You think that you've cleared out your environment, but you haven't really reset. And so that's the problem with that. Um, any loaded packages are still loaded. Anything that starts with a period is still uh, there and hiding. So um, restart your R environment or your, you know, your R process. That's better. Um, breaking into phases and saving objects uh, at logical steps um, is a good idea. Um, and I said to save, and I really mean um, like by saving objects at logical logical steps. I think I'm going to reword that one. Um, and then that one is where someday in this club, we will talk about targets because it makes that whole process of breaking things up into logical steps um, painless. Like you can work in a single RMD, but if you're doing it with targets, it'll kind of like cache the right pieces and, and regenerate things logically, um, at least as I understand it. I haven't ever actually used it. So yeah, Maybe. so that's, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh... Because you talked about working in RMD and then caching and organizing things. Yeah, I, I had uh, a long, like a good experience, but then it turned it into a horrible, horrible experience working with the caching yeah. uh, option in the in the chunks. So I've, I, I work on, I am a computational biologist. I'm a PhD student and okay. I work with a data of like large data sizes. So I usually have to save intermediate files. And I was I was so happy when I started to shift from R scripts to RMD that you can easily define the caching just by right. adding it to the option of the chunk, yeah. Right. And it it worked like charm, but Until. apparently <laughs> it it's not robust and it it's yeah. it's very vulnerable to be broken. And it happened to me, and this was heartbreaking, mm -hmm. and it it was a it was a lesson. But yeah. actually, I, I went back to the book of the R Markdown book, and the author said that this is one way, but I wouldn't even recommend it. Like it's <laughs> an easy way, but he states <laughs> he states that it's not the recommended way. Like there is another uh, lengthy uh, approach to do it to separately save things as a, as caches, but this this is another way, and it's easier and shorter. But I I would like to. To say that it's not robust, and if you try to, if you would uh, give it a try, I don't <laughs> recommend it. Yeah, uh, that's one of those things that I don't use the built-in caching. I usually end up kind of like the reason I really have to learn targets is I end up kind of doing it myself, like manually. Of I'll set up if this file exists, load it, otherwise save, and I'll you know things like that. And it's just a mess. It's that's what targets is for. So let targets. Um, deal with it and targets intelligently reruns code downstream from any changes you made. So if it if this piece is impacted by this piece and you change this piece, it'll rerun this piece. Um, yeah. That is the main idea. And it does so like it can save, you know, you can either save it locally or you can have it save, you can have it save locally and on Amazon, or you can have like this whole setup of things to keep things clean. Um, so, yeah, for sure. We need to talk about that at some point or, you know, whatever. I, I recommend reading about it and we'll probably do it in this club because I think it fits into this club, even though it's not in the book. Um, so, yeah, I'll go ahead. I will add that as probably the week when we come back. And if you want to um, own that uh, Shamsuddin, that would be great. Um, so I'll put it here. Oops.
let's make sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, when we come back on um, January 5th, uh, Sham will uh, will talk to us about targets. <laughs> Oh, but before I, I, that, <laughs> okay, you okay with that? Yeah, sure, no worries. Um, okay, and before that, next week we are talking about project oriented workflows, uh, chapter two or the project oriented workflow. Um, this chapter, I will warn you, I, I scanned through and there is uh, some stuff down at the end where let me see, um, <laughs> like aspirational placeholder of uh, that. We could talk about things outside of our studio. I, I think we can just skip that for this club. We don't care about this aspirational placeholder because we're focusing mostly on our studio. If um, you know we want to relate it to VS Code, that would be okay. And then this one, um, she says it's still rough. I don't know what the heck she's talking about. I work with projects and windows with no problem, like all the time. I don't have to do any of this. So I don't, I'm not sure what this is about. Uh, so I, I just I think it's interested or interesting that she has this. All that said, so those two sections I think we can ignore. Um, who wants to do it? Who wants to cover this next week? <laughs> can you do it, Federica? Yeah, most probably I'll, I'll do that. Yeah. All right. Okay. There we go. <laughs> um. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I intend today or tomorrow that I'll read through it and put some um, learning objectives up, but uh, uh, I'd rather not run it because I'm running like four book clubs right now and um, getting other people to present from time to time would be get a good idea. All right, and that's it. I don't have anything else. Is there anything else anyone wanted to talk about? All right. Well, then I will see all of you next week. Okay, thank you, John. <laughs> thank All you, right. John. See you. Bye. Bye. Yeah.